Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure, coming to you from Waikiki Beach. It's a beautiful day here today. Yesterday I went out stand up paddling, and I, the clarity, the visibility in the water is so excellent. I could see all the tropical fish, the humu humu nuku nuku apua'a swimming down below me, and some of the honu. I saw one honu, a sea turtle. So, uh, great day to be here. And we, we have a guest today that's going to try to bring us some visibility and some clarity into Catholic social teaching. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Watson Adventure. Today we have as our co-adventure guide, Father Jeffrey Kirby, someone that uh, you know well, uh, especially his appearances on EWTN. He's someone whose wisdom in, uh, into Catholic social teaching and other areas we really value. Uh, you know, we, we have this event here in, in Hawaii about two weeks ago where we had 20-foot surf for four or five days right here in, in, uh, in Waikiki Beach. The south swells are starting to roll through. And earlier, we had had some dredging done in Waikiki. And when my wife would go out uh, spearfishing, when we'd go out spearfishing, we just couldn't see um, the fish. You know, we could see them. We'd almost sneak up on them, but not in a good enough position to, to, to spear them for, for dinner. So we had this huge surf, and the huge surf had this, this way of cleaning out the reef. It didn't take a lot of sand from the shoreline, but it just cleaned off the coral reef. And now... The visibility is like looking through glass, back to where to where to where it usually is. And so, when I went out the other day, as I said in my warm up, we uh, saw just the beautiful clarity of those fish. Well, right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're in big surf. There's big surf out there. The 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 good is being called evil, and evil is being called good, and the truth is being twisted, and words are being twisted, uh, as Satan is so good at doing as he did in Genesis, as he did with Jesus on the, on the, at the temptation. And so we thought this would be a real good time to get some clarity. And so we've invited Father Jeffrey Kirby to come and talk with us about his new book, Sanctify Them in Truth. And you can give us the subtitle. Father Kirby, welcome back. Thank you, Barrett. It's good to be with you again. I heard you were just in Montana. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you, I, I was uh, really humbled. Uh, the bishop at uh, Great Falls Billings, uh, the diocese there, invited me to lead his priest in, in their annual retreat. So I'd never been to Montana before, so I was able to go out and spend a few days with the bishop and his priests. And I'll tell you, they're good men. They're, they're, they, they work hard. They have massive ge geographic areas that they have to cover and just have a zeal and a love for the Lord. And I, I, I'm, I'm the one giving the retreat, but most oftentimes I was the one being edified as, as I heard their, their work and their testimony and, and their love for the Lord. So it was great to be with them. You know, of course, it's good to be back in South Carolina, but uh, but Montana was beautiful. You know, isn't it something? Uh, don't tell anybody about Billings, Montana. Keep that a secret. <laughs> That's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful town, and it's 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 going to be one of those. It's it's definitely. You look at that; it's a destination site for bikers. You can you know, it's just something you want to roll through. Uh, it's you want to say it's a quaint town with these old buildings and. And some microbreweries and the mountains all around them, but just don't tell anybody. That's right. <laughs> you didn't want to lose it. Right? Did you Did you see Doug Took when you were there with OSV? No, yeah, no I didn't really. He's here. He's in Montana. Yeah, I just spoke to him about twenty minutes ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and you know, we had a cabin up in the North Fork of the Flathead River, a mile and a half from Canada, just on the west side of the Flathead River, uh, so we're looking right into Glacier Park, right you know, right on the boundary wow. of Glacier Park. And the wilderness is wild, isn't it? It is. It is. And I'll tell you, you you're, you're there in Montana, you definitely get a sense of how small we are uh, as creatures as you look at these majestic mountains. I, I was, the retreat was at Red Lodge, which is right there oh. on the Barrett Highway. Oh, my God. So, it's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just there last summer. Went right through there last summer. Yeah. So you see this majesty and grandeur, and then you think, who are we? And yet, 
we are so loved and, and elevated to such dignity by the love of our Father. So, uh, yeah, I, I really very much enjoyed my time in Montana and, and with this group of priests. Well, what do you think about that? They call it the big sky country, and it's true. You just get this sense of this immenseness, don't you, when you're there? Absolutely. In fact, there were a couple of evenings I just walked out because it was great to actually just see the sky without artificial lights to be able to just walk. And, and, and there's so much illumination by the stars and, and, and portions of the moon that, that, that were, um, were, were kind of seeping through and stuff. And just to be able to walk. And, and, and th there's a point at one evening where I couldn't even distinguish where the earth ended and the sky began because of course you can just see all the way miles and miles ahead of you and there's a point where the two just began to blur and, yes and i know that feeling yeah oh yeah hard. yeah oh. you know they they and and thumbs up or thumbs down on the buffalo burgers <laughs> did, did you have one <laughs> I have to say, I did not. I, 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 they were there, and I thought, you know what? I'm just not sure if I want to be that adventurous. I, I had to save something for my next visit to Montana. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's right. I just I just miss Montana so much in the Red Lodge area, and all that is just so beautiful. And, you know, the when I think about our, our creed for our ministry is that the most radical quest you can have in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. I think about the wild of my place up in Montana. I mean, there were grizzly bears, mountain lions. There was even a lone wolf who somehow thought that my land was his. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and, and when you get out of nature, I want to go out there and be peaceful and enjoy nature. And you realize all these bird calls and the sounds that you're hearing, these are all territorial statements that they're making. And there's a kind of a battle going on out there. Um, but, it, but, it, but it is interesting how, you know, when we fall into the hands of God, we're, we're out of control. It's a, there's a certain wildness involved in that roller coaster drop. Absolutely. When you really surrender to Jesus. Yes, when you, and, and you see it in, in the mountains and the majesty, uh, what grandeur and excitement and enthusiasm. I, I've oftentimes thought about, you know, when the apostles, you know, as they were following the Lord, every day they saw him do miraculous things, powerful things. They saw him preach with power. You can imagine they woke up every morning and thought, you know, what is the master going to do today? Amen. And, and you walk out and you see the majesty of the mountains there in Montana, and, and you know there's, there's this kind of expectation almost of what is the master going to, to going to do today, and 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 the humbling reality is we get to be a part of it, right? <laughs> that that the master whatever he does he wants us to be a part of it. So just that excitement and that joy and, and the enthusiasm of what is the master going to do today because he can do powerful, awesome, amazing things, and he's called me to be a part of it. So uh, I think there's a lot of lessons we can draw. Uh, both from the majesty of creation and then just the reality of the Lord Jesus calling each of us to follow him. You know, I was I, when I was young, when my children were younger, like in their junior high and high school, uh, my son Josh was the one producing the show. And I lived in Southern California at the time. This is back in the 90s. Uh, we would go up on these mountain hikes at night. I love to hike at night. I remember hiking under hail bop, that comet. And we'd go up at night, way up in the top of the coastal mountains, and we'd look down and we'd see literally hundreds of thousands of lights below us. And I told them, you're the only ones up here. You're the only ones that kind of chose to make this, to make this effort to come up to this mountain and to, to experience all that the Lord has for us. Mm. We have to leave some of the stuff behind. Yeah. The, you know, the, the TV channel down there that everyone's watching and the news they're yelling at, we need to step into that wild. We need to we need to step into that deeper place with the Lord. And then when you're at, when you're on a mountaintop, you get tremendous perspective. You know, like yes. you said, when you were looking off into the distance, and it just seemed to go on forever and yeah. ever. And we need that perspective right now. In in the, the situation in the world today, the con, the confusion in moral teaching. What what is the full title of your book? Yeah, so it's uh, sanctify them in truth. How the church's social teaching addresses uh, issues uh, in uh, issues of today. So. This, we're speaking with Father Jeffrey Kirby, and uh, we're talking about this book because, you know, as I said in the beginning, the the need for clarity and the need for for visibility that kind of tra uh, being a tran um, being transparent. Yes. What is what are some of the issues? And, and let's take our time. I want to move move through <laughs> those. What are, what are one of the things that you, you, you bring up in your book? 
Yeah, so as a lead into to answering your question, Bear, if I, if I can just highlight just the, the main title of the book, uh, Sanctify Them in Truth, that's taken from the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 17. So it's one of the few times that we actually see the content of our Lord's prayer. So we always see the Lord praying. He's going in the evening, he's going in the morning, but we rarely get a glimpse into what is he actually praying about? What, what is he spending all this time in prayer about? And yeah, here in John 17, the high priestly prayer, it's right in the upper room. He's preparing for his passion. And St. John gives us this, this insight, this perspective, this kind of a glimpse into what the prayer of the Lord looked like. And, and what is he praying? Barry, he's praying for us. <laughs> he's praying for us, like, you know, sanctify them in truth, uh, you know, keep them united, uh, you know, bless them, Father. Like, wow. he is interceding and, and praying for us. And, and and I was very moved, I've always been very moved by that part of the high priestly prayer where the Lord says, sanctify them in truth. He's, he's asking the Father to sanctify us, his, 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 his brothers and sisters, uh, fellow uh, siblings of, of the Father, uh, his disciples. He's saying, sanctify them in truth. So, well, so in addressing this book, I, I, I just wanted to write from the, just from the title, just stress where this is coming from. We're not right. trying to just be good people. We're not trying to be good philanthropists. We're not trying to change the world. We're trying to understand what it means to be a child of God, to understand the most excellent way of love that we've been called to live and how we can do that for ourselves and then share that message in a clear and loving way to those around us. We're talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby, who you see so often on EWTN, and uh, his book, what is the title of the book again? Sanctify? That, that means truth. truth. And, then, and the subtitle is How the Church's Social Teachings Address Issues of Our Day. And, and where, where can they find you? Yep, so it's available through the publisher, Tam Books, or um, through a local Catholic bookstore, or, or through Amazon. Where can they find you? Me, okay. <laughs> uh -huh, he's so, hiding from yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So my website's frkirby.com, and then I'm on Twitter under Father Kirby. Great. Okay. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back with Father Jeffrey Kirby. This is Daniel Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up. Shoot. A shoot is something folks today think of as plain old fun. You know, it's that tube you slide down with acceleration into a pool of warm water. But to a wagon master on the Oregon Trail, it meant nothing but toil, sweat, and swearing or praying dependent upon one's disposition. The near last shoot on the Oregon Trail is called the Laurel Hill Shoot, where immigrants like my great-grandpa, Dan, wrestled with ropes, pulleys, and sheer strength to lower his wagon and oxen down a near vertical rocky slope to the next section of the trail. Keep in mind, there were five chutes on the Laurel grade, but the Laurel Hill chute was the worst of the bunch. I'm sure the only thing that kept great grandpa and grandma going was the fact they had already come some 2,000 miles and only 50 more to go before reaching Oregon City, Oregon, the end of the trail. Their eyes were resolutely fixed on the final destination. The book of Hebrews was written to folks who were gravely struggling with their faith during a difficult time in their spiritual journey. The writer encouraged them with these words, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Grab a rope and pull, my friends. Don't lose heart. Like Jesus, there's joy set before you, too. This is Dan LeBoon Markham with CountryUp.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to 
is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Fair Wasnick. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, I'm supposed to tell you guys about my books. We have Father Jeffrey Kirby on talking about his book, uh, Sanctify Them in Truth. Uh, but I'm, uh, Sophia Institute wants me to tell you about my book. They've just republished two of my books. One is Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. We go through great uh, uh, dis, uh, exploration into the seven virtues, and, and we talk stories from some really good examples of those virtues. It's something that's really deep, but also uh, a confirmation age could, could actually read it too. It's a great book for them. And then we have the book, uh, A Surfer's Guide to the Soul, which is really kind of an allegorical, in a sense, you'll, you'll know it if you know, if you know uh, Carmelite spirituality, you'll realize, oh, he's leading us through that. But it really just talks story about the adventure. Uh, it's a testimony about uh, surrendering our, our, our our uh, lives to the Lord and asking Him to fill our lives. We ha we have Father Jeffrey Kirby with us on just a very significant time in our world. Um, you know, Father Kirby, Pilate said to Jesus, "What is truth?" Yes, yes. Um, yes. And 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 you make the, and the title of it, of it is based on Jesus' statement, "Sanctify them in the truth." Let's first ask the question: What does it mean to be sanctified? Yeah. So, sanctified. The word itself actually means to be set apart. So let's just take that at face value. It means we look at the secular world. Our secular world says we can live completely happy lives, good lives, fulfilled lives without God. That's a lie, of course. We were made by God and for God. And, of course, our world tells us live for yourself, You know, do whatever makes you happy, obey your thirst, your way right away, and so on. So or, they say, or, they say, or they say things like tell us, what, tell us your truth. I hear that on right. interviews all the time. Tell us sure. your truth, as if right. there's different versions of truth. Right, right, right. As we used to call them opinions, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, as you can imagine, in the midst of all this, to be sanctified means to be set apart. So we are we are drawn out of those. So rather than saying, you know, uh, love is whatever I want to be, except no, love is seeking the good of the other person. Uh, you know, instead of obeying my thirst, no, it's not, I'm going to order my thirst and, and, and structure my thirst in order to serve those around me and, and to show authentic love and concern for others. So, so what we do is when we sanctify, we separate ourselves from all these worldviews and ideologies and, and the lies of our fallen world, and we allow the grace of God to work within us. So we're separated from the other things of this world, the fallen things of the world. We cooperate with grace so we can then engage and be salt, light, and leaven in the midst of the world as we ourselves are trying to cooperate with grace. I, I would say that the best summary in terms of what is holiness, what, is, what does it mean to be sanctified, is given by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 12, right there at the beginning of chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. He says, Brothers and sisters, I beg you by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him, and do not be conformed to this age but rather to allow for the transformation of your mind that you might know what is good and pleasing and perfect to your Father in heaven. And Bear, I would argue that is sanctification. That's holiness. But, you know, the church has got to catch up with the current times. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, things things change. You know, we, we the church is old-fashioned. It, it, you know, the whole thing about, uh, you know, humana vitae, you know, contraception and abortion and and all these other things. What, what, tell us what are the hot button issues and how you approach, give yeah, us an example. Yeah. And, and I would just say, as we address these issues, the Lord will never allow his bride, the church, to become a widow. And if the church becomes married to the passing trends of any age, then the bride becomes a widow in the next age, right? Mm. So what are our issues today? Well, LGBTQ+, immigration, uh, the environment, uh, healthcare questions, Nutrition, hydration, in terms of those who are seriously ill. We could also speak about abortion as a preeminent, like the first life and social issue. Uh, we can also speak of critical race theory that is becoming very prominent, especially in American schools right now. So we could talk about gender equality, especially in terms of why can't women be priests in the Catholic Church? And the list goes on. So I chose specific ones as each chapter of the book. And Bear, I wanted to design the chapter where it presents the issue. It gives a virtue. It gives a principle from our social doctrine. Mm 
Wow. Because otherwise, if we don't clarify these, we're just going to speak as unbelievers and we're going to just repeat what our media tells us we're supposed to think. So immediately give a virtue and principles from our doctrine. See, these are important for us to know. I clarify them. And then I explain the church's teachings on these issues point by point. And I draw directly from the catechism of the Catholic Church. So no one thinks this oh. is my Right? Oh, I love the catechism. You know, I, I I usually teach from it every morning for 15 minutes on Facebook Live, but I've been overwhelmed in the last several months, so I haven't been able to do that. I want to get back to that because teaching that to me is is the best way of learning. But your your book um, from Jesus uh, Priestly Prayers, Sanctify Them in Your Truth. Um, give us why don't we go into the LGBTQ uh, arena there? You know, the thing about Catholic teaching is it's so rich. Rich. It isn't like uh, there's a Protestant belief that it's right because God says it's right. You know, vis-a-vis, -vis, it's true. I mean, it's 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 good, be, you know, it's moral or good because God says so, which is as if to say, well, if God said something different, then the morality would be different. But with Catholics, we go to Scripture, but we also look at reason, because God gave us a mind, and we see the why of it. Can you go into that arena? And I, I just have so much compassion for people in that area. They really do suffer a lot when they have that... Uh, gender, um, well, dysphoria or gender confusion or just, you know, the whole gender thing can be so confusing to people. So maybe you could dig into that a little bit for us. Yes, absolutely. And, and Bert, to, to just highlight uh, as well, just what you're talking about as, as Catholics, you know, we do not say just our faith alone. So in, in theology, we call fideism that someone says, well, no, God says it, therefore it is. Uh, and, and, and this is the way it's going to be. And God can change his mind. It doesn't matter. Uh, that is not Catholic teaching. And as you're stressing, we use reason. And the, re the, the, the reason why reason is so important is because this allows us to speak to non-believers. This is why we can say truth is truth, no matter whether or not you believe in God or not. Because you can just see just by reason that this is right and good and noble. It's better than the alternative. So I want to stress the reason why we emphasize faith and reason is because, first of all, it helps us to understand the substance of what God's teaching us, but then also is it allows us to speak to those around us who might not share our religious faith. So we can say, is, is something wrong because the church says it, or does the church say it because it's wrong? The church says it because it's wrong. The church doesn't have an authority to say, yes, something is right or wrong. She simply discerns and, and, and is repeating what can be observed, what can be seen by faith and reason. And God, of course, teaches us how we are called to live as, as, as his children. So with all that, if I can dive into your, your question about the LGBTQ plus movement, let me give you this story, Bear. Um, and, and I know you're, you're a man also that has a heart for other people, so you can appreciate how we should approach uh, people that we disagree with, especially those who... Uh, you know, are uh, aspects of, of spiritual darkness and moral darkness. So years ago, I was invited to this event. It was in my hometown, so I showed up. Um, you know, a lot of different worldviews present in the people that were there, a lot of old classmates and so on. Me and my Roman collar, and I, I show up, and, and I'm there at the buffet, and I'm getting some food, and these uh, two women approach me, and, and because of the affection they had been showing each other, I, I assumed that they were a lesbian couple. And I'm sitting there getting my food from the buffet, and they come up to me and they say, you think we're wrong. You think we're wrong, you know? So I looked at them, and I kind of smiled, and I said, well, you are, right? And they're like, oh, and I said, yeah, you're completely wrong. Look at what's on your plate. There's better food at this buffet than what you picked, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, but you what a great allegorical statement. Right. Well, and, yeah. and also. I didn't even think about that bear, but yes, but also just to break the ice where, you know, sometimes we can forget our sense of humor or our shared humanity because once they started laughing and they laughed almost in spite of themselves mm. and, and then they came back and they said to me, well, you think we're wrong. And I said, well, we might have some um, different views. And they said, well, what do you see when you see us? Like your church hates us. What do you see when you see us? And I said, I'll tell you what I see. I see two children of God who are well beloved by their father, who want to be loved and to love and to share the journey of life with someone who cares about them. I said, that's the first thing I see when I see the two of you. Well, that's it. All the defenses were gone, right? And Bear, that's something I could say because that's human. Like that's something we share. I want to love and be loved. I want companionship. I, I want to know that I can care for other people and that they'll care for me. And just by starting that that shared human experience and that, that same reality we have being made in the image of God, who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who is love, then they were like, well, 
we began to talk. Well, then they were, well, you, you disagree with us. I said, yes, I disagree with how you sexually express your love. But I understand the love that you're seeking. And I understand the companionship. Well, <laughs> they came and sat at my table, and we just had a great old time. It was the Catholic priest and the two lesbians having fun laughing. <laughs> okay, you know? Well, you know, you did a little G.K. Chesterton on them, you know, that kind of that, that little twist of humor. But, we, you know, Father, we have to break, but can we come back and address us again in a moment? Absolutely. Talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby, his book, uh, based on the quote of Christ, Christ's prayer, Father, sanctify them in, in the truth. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach with a deep adventure moment. I remember when I first learned to scuba dive, I, I was like a little kid. I was so excited. Uh, a friend of mine took me out, went right into the ocean, started teaching me in the shallow part of the reef. The third dive, he took me down 120 feet. And I was so thrilled because when you scuba dive, you're living in a three-dimensional space, like a bird, you know? I, like when I learned to fly like a little Cessna, you're in a three-dimensional space. You feel it when you're in a little airplane. Or when you skydive and you're under the canopy, you know, you feel the sense of being in a three-dimensional space. It never felt so alive and so great. But when I scuba dived, I went down 125 feet, and I was thinking, this is great. I was seeing sharks and barracuda and really scary-looking eels, and I was thinking, I'm going to get a really great aerobic workout while I'm down here. Uh, so I'm swimming hard and enjoying everything. And then, then I, uh, my scuba instructor came over and he checked my tank and he looked at me and he kind of cautioned me to be careful, watch my tank. And I realized then you don't go out with a scuba tank and get an aerobic workout because you're going to lose all of your oxygen. So I tried to calm down, but I couldn't. I was so excited. And then he came over to me again. His name is Guy, by the way. He, sir, he teaches uh, diving in Vietnam now, I think. He looked at my tank and said, this is not good. So he had me take off my tank, and he took off his tank, and we had to switch, which means there's a moment in time there when I won't have any oxygen, and I have to do a good job of clearing my mask in order to take that slow descent up with very little oxygen. So we made the switch. This is what Jesus did for us, scuba tank theology. Jesus dove down deep into the depth of our lives and the depth of our spirit, and he's offering you oxygen. Why wouldn't you take it when you're that deep? Receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. Receive the fresh oxygen from Jesus. This is Bear Wozniak with a Deep Adventure Moment. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Hey, we want to invite, hey, you guys, why don't you invite me to come out and speak to your, to your uh, men's conferences? Or I like going, like going talking to radio stations and having mixed conferences, too. I'd love to come out and, and get, I get so uplifted when I'm out there uh, seeing all these, these beautiful and powerful Christians. But I also want to invite you, especially the men, to go to deepadventure.com. And join Bear's Man Cave and our three-year school of manliness. You, you're uh, when you join, you become part of a group of about a dozen guys, and and uh, we we meet together once a month as the whole man cave, and then uh, once a month you meet with your small group, and we go through the same curriculum together, of these 36 different areas of manliness. And what's really cool that's happening is that men are joining. And they get their own username and password and can click through all the beautiful the videos and audio and written. Uh, that things that we have there, but now the fathers are saying, I want to go through this with my son. So if your son is confirmation age or older, um, and even your daughter uh, can go through the first year of the curriculum, it's all on the virtues, and uh, and you can lead your family in a really interesting journey, as long as I think if they're confirmation age or older. So go to deepadventure.com and, and uh, join the man cave, and of course for the women, go there and join our mama bears. We're here with Father Jeffrey Kirby, his book um, based on Christ's priestly prayer, Father, sanctify them in the truth. You know, Father, um, I have so much compassion for people that are in the, in the gay lifestyle. 
um, I, you know, I, it, it's got to be, first of all, to make that choice to do that is just really hard because you're already being set up to be um, ridiculed or not understood. But I love the Catholic uh, teaching on that, and that is, as you said, magio dei. We don't call people um, homosexuals, or or we we say that they're made in God's image and they have same-sex attraction, and things like that. And so often, I I, I know uh, d- just anecdotally, and I know also statistically that so many of them, so many men especially, have been imprinted by a a. a a, a, an, an experience, a pederasty of a man, uh, you know, you know, having uh, abusing them sexually when they were young, and so there's so much brokenness out there. So I have I have great compassion on them, and we love them, but at the same time, the way for healing, the healing is truth. So yeah. not as what is your truth, what what is the what is the truth about this 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 situation these days with that community. Yeah. So emphasizing what you're saying too, Bear, about, you know, we talk about, you know, God, <clears throat> each person being made in the image of God, and we would never speak of, of person as, you know, that person is a homosexual. It's only saying, well, this person might have homosexual desires and so on. In the same way, we would never refer to someone as disordered. But what we do reference is that our affections can be disordered. And this is important because even like one of the prefaces during Mass in Lent, it speaks about for the whole community, our disordered attractions to the things of this world. So this is a term that is not, you know, something we just use in terms of homosexual desire, but this is something we use regularly in terms of the Christian way of life, that there's an order of living, there's a way of love, and when we do something that's out of that order, when it's not in harmony with what uh, is designed by our creation, there's a disorder. So I know that food is for my nutrition, for my well-being. If I continue to eat beyond what I need, so I begin to indulge in gluttony, I have a disordered attraction to food, right? I'm a glutton. So we use this term a lot in terms of our moral theology. In terms of the uh, homosexual desire, we would speak of that this is a disorder. Now, some of those people say, you're calling us disordered, or you're saying that, you know, that uh, we are somehow broken and, and so on. And first, first I would say, well, we're all broken. <laughs> but, but when we use that term, we're speaking of the affection. We would never call a child of God a disorder. Mm. We would say that there's a disorder, that there's a natural attraction that exists within the human family. Man for woman, woman for man. And if someone has an attraction that is out of that order, it's a disordered affection. There's something that's there. We live in a fallen world. God allows fallen things to happen. It's there. And the person has to address that and understand, well, okay, this has been permitted. God's permissive will allows bad things to happen all the time. And it becomes an invitation to carry across and to order this affection. Right. The truth. And, right. and I think aspects of what, what we're just summarizing are so important. Well, Father, we're going to move to another subject now. That, that's, I think it's a, if you want to know more, go deeper with that. You can get Father Jeffrey Kirby's book, uh, Sanctify Them in the Truth. Um, the, let's talk for a moment about abortion because that's really on everybody's minds right now. You know, when you go, when you go back into the Didache, it talks against pederasty. You know, a homo, a man on boy, yep. sexual abuse. But right in there, in those those short little that short little area, the Didache was like the original catechism back around seventy or something A.D. Uh, to, uh-huh. for catechists that were on their way to becoming uh, Christians, and uh, it talks about abortion right there too. It predates some of the written New Testament. Mm-hmm. It is an oldest summary, as you as you're saying, Bear, of the Christian way. The, the way, way it's the, called, yeah, right. And, and 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 right there we see it. So with abortion, I, I think that you know, in terms of, you know, we look at embryology today, the development of the medical sciences. It is clear that life begins at conception. We can see this. Uh, that is a, not just a statement of faith. That's a statement of reason. That's a statement of science, right? But, but I'll tell you what we find within the church is this very uh, manipulative spirit where we will hear this a lot, and, and regrettably even some from, from some priests and some moral theologians or theologians in general who will say, yes, 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 this is terrible, but it's on an equal standing. It's a, on an equal set setting of all the other social issues, so capital punishment, immigration, and so on. And, and that is a great mistake. Now, now aspects of, of what I've just summary is sometimes called the seamless garment theory. Now, I say that, but there are 
aspects of the theory, the seamless garment theory, that can be actually very good. So the variations of, of, of this theory um, over, the, over the past several decades. But oftentimes when it's used, it's meaning that all the social issues, all the life issues are equal. Therefore, the church has to give equal reaction and response to each one, that they all have the same dignity, the same level in terms of a hierarchy of truth. Now, that's not true <laughs> because our, our tradition has always been clear that there are some moral issues that require the exercise of prudence. So, for example, in immigration, people of goodwill can disagree on the solutions that are, that are possible with immigration. And there can be many possibly good solutions within that issue. So we say that's a moral issue that is bound to prudence. So there's some flexibility. There's room for discernment and debate and for attempting one aspect of policy or law and then to realize, no, we need to change this and so on. When it comes to abortion and euthanasia, because it offends directly the dignity of life and is a direct attack on a vulnerable person. So again, the, the, those who are seriously ill or, or the unborn child, uh, it is what we say an absolute moral truth. That means there is no prudence necessary. There is no circumstance, no intention, no situation in which that will ever be permissible. So it's distinct. In terms of a hierarchy of truth, it's at the very top. So for a moral theologian or a priest who know better to say, well, no, these absolute moral truths are equal to prudential moral truths is a great lie. And it's done in order to diminish the church's response to these life issues. And, and, and I'll tell you, in your uh, promo for some of your programs, you referenced the mother as being mama bears. Um, let's never forget that the church is mother. And when it comes to her children, especially the vulnerable, those in the womb, those who are dying, she is a full out mother bear. Like there is no room. You will not mess with her children. She will defend their dignity. She will argue for their, their value and that they should be cared for and loved and protected and cherished. So, so, this this we use the term in theology the preeminence of abortion it means it's above every other social issue every other life issue abortion and euthanasia but that's such a powerful wow that's just, just really so powerful and you know you, you wonder why are people so angry uh, uh those who are pro-choice uh, as they say or pro-abortion um it's, it's a woman you know you, a woman's right to choose and i think well half of the babies being killed are women right you know, there right. doesn't seem to be any compassion for that woman. Right. And then right. also it's become such a big thing. Uh, you know, Margaret Sanger and the whole thing about it is most of these, so many of these abortion clinics, more, more, most of them, or large, more, greater percentage of them are in black communities and minority communities. It's, it's uh, you know. Exactly. Yep. And, and it's a misplaced understanding. I mean, think, Bear, if, if a person lived his or her life with the belief that there is no truth, there are no boundaries. There are no moral obligations or responsibilities outside of themselves. Anything, anything, God, the church, government, marriage, any structure, any organization, any institution that would tell them that they are somehow bound to something beyond themselves is immediately a threat. And that's what we have. That's what happens when our autonomy, which is our self-possession, which is good. Like we need self-possession because then we can give ourselves to someone else, right? Oh. We don't have our, we can't give ourselves, right? So, but autonomy becomes radicalized where self-possession becomes everything. And, and, and that self-possession that's supposed to move to wow. self-donation is completely abandoned. Okay, okay. We got to cut here. But uh -oh. when we come back, I want you to please repeat that exact. That's so deep. Please, please bring that right back to us when we come back. Repeat the whole thing, go a little bit deeper. Sure. Talking with Father uh, Jeffrey Kirby. We've got to have you back on again, Father, if you can spare the time. His book is, is called, can you give us the title again? Sanctify Them in Truth, How the Church's Social Teachings Addresses Issues of Our Day. And, and if they want to find you, where do they find you? Yep. Uh, my website's frkirby.com, and I'm on Twitter at Father Kirby. Yeah, so you can find this book anywhere, uh, and it's... it's uh, um, sanctify them in the truth or just look up Father Jeffrey Kirby you'll find him in Amazon we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans mortgages SBA loans and 
depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to remind everybody our TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak, our motorcycle TV show with this group of really good men that we ride all over, all over the country. Um, just go, moving in God's will and seeing God do stuff. I like to use that expression because God likes to do stuff. Um, you can see that on EWTN on Thursdays, and also it's on Prime Video. Uh, but if you really want to... Uh, sink your teeth into it. You can go to deepadventure.com, become a mama bear, or become a, a man cave member, and then you have access to all of the all of the videos. We give you a, a link to the private link to the YouTube videos of all of the episodes, all three seasons. Plus, uh, we're working on the Hawaii edits now, and we've got two of the episodes already ready, so you get to see them a year before everybody else. So go to deepadventure.com, become a, a mama bear, become a member of a bear's man cave in the Bear School of Manliness. We have uh, Father Jeffrey Kirby with us in his book, uh, based on the priestly prayer of, prayer of Christ, um, God sanctify them in the truth, in the truth. What you just said, I, I want to have dark underlines and in bold print. Can you repeat what you just said to us at the break? Yeah, so what we find, uh, actually in all the moral issues, but especially when it comes to abortion, or, or to some of the social issues that address our, our sexual powers or, or love or intimacy, is this whole debate where our autonomy becomes radicalized. Now, autonomy, it, the word just means self-will. And, and what that means basically is self-possession, that I can, I can possess myself, I know who I am. And that's important, it's a gift from God because by having myself, knowing who I am, I can give myself to another. So we say our self-possession leads to self-donation. So we see this in the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're distinct persons, but they're constantly pouring themselves out in love and service to one another. So I have my self-possession, this autonomy, in order to love and serve others. But what happens oftentimes is that autonomy becomes radicalized. The self-possession becomes an entity all by itself. We become sovereign selves. People be begin to believe that they are truly the Lord, the sovereign, the king of their own lives. So, so there is no self-donation. There are no expectations beyond themselves, no responsibilities. And instead, this, it becomes this very uh, a bloated sense of self possession to this this autonomy and bear we know as we witness this in, in the lives of many people uh, some of whom are people who are close to us people we love people that we might minister to that is the sure path to misery to meaninglessness to a sense of desolation and yet still our fallen world will tell people and especially the pro-abortion movement no 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 that's the meaning of life that's the purpose that's the goal so we have absolutized autonomy i will do whatever i want my way right away and then of course with that becomes a really demented sense of freedom freedom means i can do whatever i want but we know from saint paul that freedom is the power to do what is right and good that's real right? freedom isn't it it is freedom, the freedom that you know because so often paul said well, i, I want to do this but i do that you know I, I try to do this but i fail but i fail but the, the real freedom is to have that power and discipline comes the word disciple has the word discipline right in it, you know. The way, if you want to go into a journey of devastation, go into a journey of total, uh, you know, freedom to do whatever you feel like doing, that's a, that's a great means to get trapped. And if you want to know where all these people in this, this, this the inward, downward spiral into Dante's Inferno, it's, it's, this, it's this, 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 uh, this, this self-love. Hey, can I ask you an academic question? Because I'm not a lot smart. Is part of what you're saying... Uh, go under the realm of personalism, the, the philosophical. Absolutely. It, it, uh, yeah. And that's, that's a John Paul II. John Paul II was a personalist philosopher. But, you know, his, his um, I think of Thomas Aquinas, love is willing to true good for the other. And then, and you, then you marry that to John Paul II's statement that it, love is self-donation. 
Yeah. That yeah. I love that because we have the self autonomy to give ourselves, Amen. to choose when and where and how to yes, give and, ourselves. And, and in that dynamism, we realize that the possession that we have of ourselves that we give to another, that very act of donation helps us then to understand even more so who we are and to possess ourselves even more. Oh. So. So John Paul II would say, only in the sincere gift of himself does man come to the understanding of who he truly is. John Paul II also says, and I, I really, as you're describing, Bear, it, through his personal philosophy, he, he really enhanced and helped us understand the, the richness of the church's teachings. Because John Paul II makes this small statement that I think well, rocks my world. He says that the only adequate response to the person is love. They're not, they're not the object they're the subject exactly. of love. And you know, the exactly. thing is, is, is he said, Jesus said, if, you, if he who tries to keep his life loses it, he who loses his yes. life saves his life. It, yes. it's, it's in the very act of giving that we really find out, wow, this is, this is the way God made me. This is who I am. And it's in that yes. act of giving that you become more and more like Christ, because after all, he's the one who gave you life. He's, he's the great giver. And John Paul II's first writings, Love and Responsibility. You know, yes. one wants to hear that part. You know, oh, I fell in love or I fell out of love. Like it wasn't a, de a decision in the first place. Right. Just, uh, as, if, as if love is simply about emotional fulfillment. And, and, and that's not love. In fact, in, in its most extreme form, that's actually narcissism. <laughs> right? It's selfishness. Wow. That, that love is my personal subjective satisfaction. So when you no longer satisfy me, then I don't love you anymore. And, and that, again, is just the height of selfishness. Well, you know, it's not like the Bible says for God so love the world that he felt all gushy inside right 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 right, right, he right. gave he, and, and you know what father at the cross we see this ultimate gift of jesus christ but as a father i'd much rather it was me on the cross than one of my children and yes. so we have to look at the donat self-donation of the father too and yes. sending his son to ra to raise our dignity we have just a few more minutes. Will you touch on one other area that's in your book? Uh, the book is called Sanctify Them in the Truth, and it's by Father Jeffrey Kirby. Yes, I, I think the one, so after the LGBTQ, the one issue that's been probably the most pressing in terms of communication with, with uh, the faithful, with parents, with, with uh, community leaders, has been the critical race theory. So there's this very um, you know, Marxist-based belief that uh, be, simply because someone does not belong to a certain racial group uh, or, or, or group in general, then therefore they are inherently racist and therefore must be treated as a threat. The institutions created by uh, the people outside of this uh, group uh, have to be dismantled because they are inherently racist and so on. And, and Bear, I get e emails from people who say, look, Father, this is coming up in our homeowners association meetings. This oh. is coming up on the sidelines of youth sport events. Like, please help us. And, and, and my response to the whole critical race theory confusion is the strong, noble virtue of justice. That justice says, I will judge you by the content of your character, not by what you look like, not where you come from, not who you might be related to, not what you may have done in the past, but I will judge you by the content of your character. Justice demands I judge the person in front of me based on what he says, what he does. That is justice. I don't judge him because, well, they don't belong to a certain racial group or they don't have certain means or in the past they may have done something. Uh, that is a violation of justice on each of these scores. And, and what's interesting is we forget that in our own country, the civil rights movement was begun and sustained by Christian clergy, right? Right. And the eminent among them was Dr. Martin Luther King, who said Amen. very clearly, we all quote, I have a dream that he would be prayed that his children would one day be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's, that's almost like an exact quote, basically, from him. You know, Absolutely. And, and, and he's drawing there from the scriptures there and, and from, from a, a healthy understanding of, of justice in any civilized society. You imagine living in a world where simply because you're not of a certain racial group, you are therefore considered wrong and guilty of something? Or because you happen to create a, a business or a, a youth sports program or or a program to help men because you're not part of a particular racial group therefore your organization or your institution is inherently racist and must be deconstructed that is the height of of, of injustice and, and that is the critical race theory and we have to be very careful of this it's very luciferic 
It, it, it causes what would otherwise be harmonious communities. It causes a lot of false tension that's then heightened. Not even, right, right. And they become enemies, whereas before they were friends. Well, we have to take a break, Father. This is our final break. I'm so sorry. we got to have you back as soon as we can. All I know is that uh, when people bleed, they all bleed red, regardless of the color of their skin. And when Jesus died on the cross, that blood that flowed uh, from his wounds uh, was red. And we're, so we all need to just seek humility and seek forgiveness and seek redemption from that supreme act of love. And as you were saying earlier, through uh, willing the true good and through self-donation, uh, by through servant leadership, we can, um, we can not change the world, just to help change one person's life, you know, just yeah. a little bit. We're talking about Father Jeffrey Kirby, and the name of the book, Father, is? Thanks, by them and Truth, uh, How the Church's Social Teaching Addresses Issues of Our Day. Father Kirby, where can they find you? So my website's frkirby.com, and then on Twitter, Father Kirby. Can we, I'm going to ask you on, t, on the radio, can we get you back here in another couple months? Yeah, oh my goodness, goodness yes. Yeah, talking with you is always a joy. <laughs> to, <laughs> a believer, I feel like we could talk all day. Yeah, you I know. know. I, yeah. When you have believers together who love the Lord, the conversations can, can continue. Like we talk to the Lord, we have good things to say to one another. So, I, I, uh -huh. yes. I, yeah. 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 Well, this is the Bear Wozniak adventure. We got to get going. Um, as we say here in Hawaii, you know, when God breathed into his, his, the human, uh, his spiritual, rational soul, when he breathed his breath into him, we became amphibians. You know, we, as early church fathers say, we have a, a, a spirit that's kind of like lives in the heavenly places, then we have this physical body that's here on earth. And so I want to give you that, that, say that thing that the Hawaiians say, aloha, which means to give breath. And that's what God did at, at, in Genesis when he aloha uh, Adam. So may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. You say it with me, Father? Aloha. Yeah, shake up everybody where you are. We'll be, right, we'll be, at, be back next week with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books. And since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict Exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too. Plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. <music>